Yes, Chairman Boyd, we can get started. Yeah, and again, Vanessa, would you do a roll call, please? Yes, Chairman. And again, there is someone with their mic that is not muted. If you could please mute your mic before I go forward. Thank you, Chairman. I will start with the official roll call. Norman Boyd. Here. Roger Folsom. Here. Elena Cummings. Here. Mark Trail. Here. David Cruz. David Cruz. Anthony Williamson. Here. Kenneth Davis. Here. Russell Crutchfield. Present. Russ Childers. Here. And I will ask again, David Cruz. Here, here. Thank you. Chairman, that concludes the roll call. Thank you, Denisha. And looks like we have 100% uh, board attendance today. And thank you very much for uh, joining the meeting. The commissioner and I are here in the conference room. And we will at this time call the meeting to order and uh, move into the agenda. Today's agenda, uh, we've all had a chance to look at it and materials that were sent to us. We have uh, six items to consider this morning for final adoption vote, one item for uh, initial adoption. Before we move into that, uh, I'd like to call on Elena Cummings, our secretary, in regarding the minutes of the September 10 meeting. And Elena, have you got a chance to review those and do you recommend those for adoption? Chairman Boyd, I have reviewed the minutes from the September 10th meeting and find them to be in order as written and make a motion that they be approved. Is there a second to that motion? I'll make a second, Ken Davis. And uh, Dr. Davis has seconded that and all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Hearing none, the minutes are approved. Thank you, Elena. This morning there was a WebEx uh, meeting. I believe uh, uh, Mr. Childers chaired the uh, audit committee meeting this morning, and uh, I'd like to uh, call on him to give us a report of the audit committee, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the audit committee did meet this morning. Both Mr. Cruz and Mr. Crutchfield were on the call. Um, we received a rather extensive report from the Office of Inspector General with 11 findings, most of which seemed to be administrative in nature, um, with a few that weren't, but uh, all answered, I thought, adequately by our staff. Um, we also, um, they also pointed out um, that our program integrity section of the CMO contract has been revamped as a result of the um, audit. The, um, and there's some other initiatives that they discussed. They seem to have a good handle on things and our staff seems to be uh, very responsive to their questions and very um, diligent in their work. Uh, that would conclude the audit committee report. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions for Mr. Childers related to the audit committee uh, from the board members, please? Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Mark Trail. I just point out I was on the call also. Yes, okay. Very good. Any other comments or questions? Hearing none, thank you very much, Mr. Childers, for your report. And uh, I will now turn it over to Commissioner Berry for uh, his uh, commissioner report. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Thank you very much. Um, this week is Customer Service Appreciation Week, the uh, 5th through the 9th. And there are several people in the department that were nominated by their peers um, to receive an award or recognition um, from um, 
from the department. And I just wanted to give you a, a couple of names that were uh, recognized again by their peers for great customer service. Mary Peterson uh, per Perkinson, uh, Tina Register, Douglas uh, Tatum, uh, Kiana Jackson, Mula Xavier, uh, Shanna Young, Bruce Henderson, Laconda Zaire, and Jeffrey Rozier. Again, were people from within the department that were recognized for outstanding customer service. If you remember, we have four major areas. Tremendous amount of feedback. Let's see if we can. We have four major areas, customer service, communication, teamwork, and accountability, with customer service being our number one priority. So I certainly want to recognize those DCH team members for the work that they do. Uh, that's within the department. From outside of the department, uh, Anna Adams from the Georgia Hospital Association, Russell Carlson, who works with the uh, Nursing Home Association, Matt Hicks uh, from Grady Hospital, Mark Sexton with GEMA, all have done just incredible customer services. We have partnered with them over the last uh, nine months in particular as we have been facing um, some of the challenges that we've been faced with. Uh, I also want to recognize, again, from a customer service standpoint, Kathleen Toomey, the commissioner for the Department of Public Health, for her outstanding work as it relates to customer service and the work that she has done, not only as it has focused on COVID, but on uh, flu vaccinations this upcoming season and the importance of those. And I wanted to wrap up. Yesterday, I had an opportunity to participate in a, uh, uh, a discussion and a um, press conference with Governor Kemp. And Governor Kemp spoke to the press, uh, which, which in some regards means all of the citizens of Georgia and really put forward again from a customer service standpoint, his accessibility, but really focused on four major areas. One, continue to wear your mask. Two, pay attention to social distancing. Number three, wash your hands. And number four, get your flu shot. For the governor to get out in front of the press and really, really focus on those areas um, on a regular basis, uh, again, from a customer service standpoint, we couldn't be more fortunate to have him pushing those areas um, on both public health's behalf, uh, certainly partnering with public health and Dr. Toomey on that, but for all of us um, that, that work in state government, uh, for him to be as accessible and for him to push and embrace these concepts as hard as he has um, on behalf of the citizens of Georgia, we couldn't be more fortunate. Um, so again, customer service week, I know that sounds a little bit odd to, to include people from outside of the department, um, but I think it's really important. And then uh, again, wrap up with those frontline workers. While we are seeing a tremendous um, downturn in the amount of positivity uh, rates and things like that, those frontline workers, uh, nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists that have continued to go uh, to work every day, uh, both people that have worked uh, in Georgia for quite some time or people that have been brought in from out of state to help us as we have fought, fought COVID-19. We want to thank them for their uh, unwavering commitment to the customer service approach that we have desperately needed. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it back over to you, but certainly wanted to uh, give those people their due. So thank you very much. And I can answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Are there any questions or comments uh, for the Commissioner, please, from the board? Hearing none. Mr. Chairman. Oh, yes, Mr. Schultz. This is Russ. I neglected to add one thing that I meant to do in my report. If you don't mind, I'll do it just real quickly. Yes, please. One of the statements that was made during the report I thought would be interesting to all the board members and others, and that is that it was estimated that approximately $41 million wasn't subject to adequate oversight in the years between 2013 and 2019. That sounds like a lot of money until you understand that DCH spends $30 million a day in Medicaid payments, and that was a six year period of time. So less than a day out of six years, 
in terms of of remarkable. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Childers, for for those comments because that really does put it in in context uh, of of what that issue was. So. Thank you for sharing that. Is there any comments or questions on that from the board members? Hearing none, thank you. And we will move into the areas that will require our, our vote today. And first of all, I'll call on uh, Kim Morris, uh, Director of Reimbursement Financial Management. And uh, she will take up the first item of rules and regulations for hospital care and you may uh, proceed, uh, Kim. If you're on the if you're on the call, I think you are. Yes. Good morning, Chairman Board, Commissioner Barry, and members of the board. Um, I'm presenting for final approval a request to repeal the rules and regulations for hospital care for the indigent under Chapter 290-5-5 and publish amended hospital care for the indigent rules under chapter 111-3-12. The proposed rules and regulations for hospice, hospital care for the indigent under chapter 111 is updates to replace the existing rules. We're gonna be replacing the name of the department, correct the rule numbering, numbering, and any grammatical errors. This does not change any uh, provisions of the existing an opportunity for public comments was held on September 15, 2020. Written comments were due on or before September 25th, 2020. There were no public or written comments received. If there are no questions, I would ask the board for final approval to repeal the rules on the chapter 290-5-5 and publish amended hospital care for the indigent rules on the chapter 111-3-12. Are there any questions or comments for Kim from the board, please? Hearing none, is there a motion for approval for final adoption? This trail also move. The motion's been made for approval. Is there a second? Crutchfield second. Russell Crutchfield has seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstaining? Hearing none, it is approved, and thank you very much, Kim. Thank you. Our remaining final adoption items are all in the area with uh, Melanie Simon. And Melanie, I will uh, turn it over to you, and you may uh, proceed with your presentations, uh, I assume, in the order of the agenda here, the first being rules and regulations for birth centers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good morning, members of the board and Commissioner Barry. The Division of Healthcare Facility Regulation is presenting rules today for final adoption for birth centers, um, similar to the rules that Kim presented. These are being repealed under Chapter 290-541, which was previously under the Department of Human Resources, um, and that agency, of course, has been renamed. And these rules are being moved to Chapter 11187. Um, there are no substantive changes to the rules. Um, it's just to move them over to be under the other rules that are applicable to health care facility regulation and the Department of Community Health. We did hold a public comment period. We had a hearing on the 15th, and written comments were accepted through the 25th of September. No comments were received. And therefore, if there are no questions, um, we are respectfully requesting consideration for final adoption of these rules today. Thank you. Any questions, comments from the board for Melanie? Hearing none, is there a motion for approval for final adoption? Folsom moved for approval. Roger Folsom has moved for approval. Is there a second? Trail so move. Mark Trail has seconded the motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Hearing none, the uh, opposition, it is approved. Thank you. 
And Melanie, you may proceed to your next item. Thank you. The next set of rule changes relates to health maintenance organizations. These are being moved from Chapter 29537 over to Chapter 111829. No comments were received regarding the proposed changes, and therefore um, we are also respectfully requesting final adoption of these rules for health maintenance organizations today. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, is there a, a, a motion for approval for final adoption? Trail so move. Mark Trail moves for adoption or for approval. Is there a second? Elena having a second. second. Um, Elena has seconded. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. There is a, uh, someone opposed? Okay, any uh, abstaining? Uh, hearing uh, none, the vote would uh, then uh, approve the regulation. Thank you. Melanie, you may Thank uh, you. proceed. Thank you. The next set of rules is for x-ray devices. These are found um, in 29522 and are being moved over to chapter 111 890. Um, and again, there are no substantive changes. This is just to move the rules over to the correct chapter. We did not receive any comments regarding these proposed changes as well and are requesting final adoption today. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, is there a motion for approval for final adoption? Richfield and Ms. Childers moved. Ms. Childers has moved for final adoption approval. Is there a second? Trail second. Mark, Mark Trail has seconded the motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Hearing none, it, it, it is approved for final adoption. Thank you, Melanie. You may proceed. The next request is for adoption of final rules for laser radiation. These are being moved from Chapter 29527 over to Chapter 111891. No comments were received on these rules, and there are no substantive changes being mm -hmm. made. We would request consideration for final adoption of these rules today. Thank you. Questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, is there a, a motion for approval for final adoption? Also motion for approval. Roger Carson has made the motion for approval. Is there a second? Roger Field second. Second. seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Hearing none, it is approved. And Melanie, you may move to your final item uh, related to disaster preparedness plans. Thank you. The rules and regulations for disaster preparedness plans are found in chapter 111816. We are requesting final adoption today of changes to these rules. These changes are necessary in order for the department to comply with House Bill 987 also known as the Disabled Adults and Elder Persons Protection Act, and the portions of that bill that relate specifically to disaster preparedness. An opportunity for public comment was held during a WebEx event on September 16th, and written comments were due on or before September 25th of 2020. We received two oral comments, one from Jennifer Lollies with Cedar Hill Senior Living, and from Michelle Greenwell, with Annadale at Sewanee. We received two written comments from Arnold Goldman Gregory and from Pam Clayton, Vice President of the Georgia Healthcare Association. Um, the following is a summary of the comments that were made on these proposed rule changes. A recommendation was made to add requirements for facilities to develop policies and procedures on testing, to follow those policies and procedures, and to maintain documentation of testing 
and or testing refusal. The DCH response to this comment is that the rule was developed based on the statutory requirements in House Bill 987. Policies and procedures are already required as part of the facility's pandemic plan. Additionally, the rules for each program um, for the nursing home, assisted living community, or personal care home, those rules already require documentation of this type to be in the resident files and or the personnel files as appropriate. As such, we did not feel it was necessary to restate the documentation requirements in this context. We also try not to be overly prescriptive about documentation and the use of particular forms, as some long-term care facilities are chains and they do operate in multiple states and may have corporate best practices that they use. Are there any questions about this particular comment? Any questions, comments from the board? Hearing none, Melanie, you may proceed. Thank you. The next comment, um, a responder expressed support for the rule that allows the department to consider widespread supply shortages in surveying the requirements for personal protective equipment or PPE. The responder requested that the department exercise this discretion in a uniform and consistent manner. The DCH response is that the department appreciates this comment and will provide training to surveyors to support uniform application of the rule. And I would also add that we do have the benefit of updates and information, both from the Department of Health and from GEMA, our sister agencies, um, with regard to any widespread PPE shortages. The next um, comment we received was concern about the rule that requires providers to maintain and publish for its residents and their representatives or legal surrogates, policies and procedures pertaining to infection control and mitigation of in infectious disease within their facilities and the requirement that they update those policies and procedures annually. The responder requested that the department consider providing interpretive guidance to allow facilities to provide the information only upon request um, as opposed to a required annual update and communication. The DCH response is that transparency with residents and families is critical during this public health emergency. The facility may use a variety of means to communicate the information, but residents and families need to know the measures that facilities are taking to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and other infectious diseases. As with any rule change, the department will revisit the request for interpretive guidance at a later date if warranted based on survey experience. The final comment received on the, these rule changes was concern about the requirement for initial baseline molecular COVID-19 testing for all residents and direct care staff. The responder requested that the requirement be modified to accept point of care antigen testing in lieu of the molecular testing. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services is providing point of care antigen testing devices to all nursing homes and some assisted living communities that have a certificate of waiver to perform such tests under the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment, known as CLIA. The department's response to this comment is that we are aware of this development and will work to accommodate the antigen testing through waiver declarations or other appropriate legal means. This concludes all of the comments received on these proposed changes. Um, as such, we are requesting consideration for final adoption today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there questions or comments for Melanie on this subject from the board? Hearing none, is there a motion for approval for final adoption? Trail, so move. Our trail has moved for final adoption. Is there a second to that motion? Folsom yeah, second. Yeah, um, Roger Folsom has seconded this. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Hearing none, it is approved. And thank you, Melanie, for all the work that you've put into this. I know that uh, and appreciate the opportunity to review all the materials in advance of the meeting 
as, as we normally do, and we've had time to do that, and thank you for, for that work. The last item on the agenda here to consider, and this will be considered for initial adoption, Lynette Roots will uh, make a presentation on, on uh, medical assistance plan and uh, demonstration waiver application. Good morning, and thank you, Chairman Boyd, uh, board members, and Commissioner Barry. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this morning. Pending initial adoption from the board and approval from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, we are proposing to extend postpartum services for pregnant women from 60 days to 180 days or six months. Currently, our state plan provides coverage for pregnancy-related and postpartum services for a period of 60 days, beginning on the last day of the woman's pregnancy. Per the provisions of House Bill 1114, which was signed into law on July the 16th, 2020, the department was directed to submit a state plan amendment or an 1115 waiver, which provides for the extension of postpartum services. Based upon discussions and guidance received from CMS, the department will be moving forward with the submission of a five-year 1115 waiver. The proposed effective date is July 1, 2021. It is important to note that the existing state plan provisions, which allow for 60 days of coverage, will remain in place. The proposed 1115 waiver will simply add an additional four months or 120 days of postpartum coverage for a total coverage period of six months. Coverage will be continuous and there will be no gaps in services. There are no cost sharing or co-payment requirements under this proposed waiver. The eligible populations will be qualified pregnant women with incomes up to, but not exceeding, 220% of FPL. The one change, Chairman Boyd and board members, is the addition of resource mother services that will be provided to mothers who give birth to a very low birth weight baby. The resource mother benefit will assist with linking mothers to community resources to assist with the social determinants of health. And this benefit will also assist the mother in obtaining preventive health visits, primary care medical appointments, and non-emergency transportation. Moving forward with this 1115 waiver will help to reduce postpartum maternal morbidity and mortality in the state of Georgia by ensuring continuity of care and, of course, extending and improving access to care. The expenditures for the expansion of postpartum services for state fiscal 22 are as follows. Total cost for low income Medicaid is 62 million. $148,386. Of this amount, the state funds portion is $20,574,223. The federal funds portion is $41,574,163. The total cost for Peach Care for Kids is $249,592. Of this amount, the state funds portion is $60,133. The federal funds portion is $189,459. There will be two opportunities for public comment. The first opportunity for public comment will be held on Thursday, October the 15th at 11 a.m. via WebEx. And the second opportunity for public comment will be held on Monday, October 19th at 10 a.m. in Savannah, Georgia. 
I will now pause for any questions from the board. Are there any questions or comments from the board, please? Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Mark Trell. I have two questions. One, um, I think maybe uh, an obvious answer, but given this is a law passed, I'm assuming there's appropriation for it. That is correct. Um, we were appropriate, uh, appropriated a total of $59 million. $704,892. Thank you. Uh, one other question, Mr. Chairman. Um, if I might ask the, the date for implementation, I know when we made changes before, years ago in some uh, pregnancy related services, there was a question about whether folks get grandfathered in or not. I mean, so we're talking about implementation January of 21. Um, will that, will, who will be affected by this? Those who are covered but haven't delivered, those who may be delivered within the past 60 days? Um, any thoughts on that? Yes, sure. Good question. So the effective date, uh, Mr. Trail, is going to be July 1 of 2021. And we're going to go back and pick up um, anyone who would have delivered 60 days prior. Um, so absolutely great question. Yes, we've incorporated that into our planning. And so we are going to go back and pick up um, those individuals who would have who would have delivered, let's say, in April. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions, comments? Hearing none, is there a motion for approval for initial adoption? Uh, this is Trail. I'll make the motion. Mark, Mark Trail is, is proposing uh, approval for initial adoption. Is there a second? Russ Childers has seconded. Russ Childers has seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. That concludes our uh, items for uh, consideration today. Is there any anyone know about any business that needs to come before the board? Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, just a couple of additional items. One, I want to revisit the, uh, the the last item that Lynette addressed, and I want to recognize Sharon Cooper, uh, Dean Burke. Uh, from the General Assembly, who really pushed those um, that that amendment or that um, increase in funding and the extension of the time, uh, just an incredible job that they did. But I also want to recognize the late Jack Hill, uh, Chairman Butch Parrish, and Chairman Terry England, who also supported that initiative. Um, it was just a remarkable accomplishment that they did, and I want to thank them for their work. And then I may have mistakenly left off three people of our DCH Dream Team, and I apologize. Geraldine Montgomery, uh, Annie Parks, along with uh, Erica Perry. If I made a mistake and did not include them in the original announcement, I uh, certainly want to recognize them for their teamwork. So that was all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Are there any other comments or anything that needs to come before the board? Hearing nothing, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much for joining us. Our next meeting will be November the 12th at 1030 a.m. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.